Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bread of Life channel. I have the great privilege today to have Dr. Ryan Mullins on the show. He has done so much work with the concept of God and how God relates to time. He has He's the author of a book called The End of the Timeless God. Um, he's also written like 30 essays on various topics related to models of God and uh, the Trinity, the problem of evil, the incarnation, and this issue of God and time. So, And he also has a podcast called The Reluctant Theologian. So please check out his podcast. The links to his website and his podcast are in the description of this video. So welcome, Dr. Mullins. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, could you tell us a little bit about your journey with, um, you know, how you came to write this book, The End of the Timeless God? Mm -hmm. So the story actually starts in high school. I was in this, I went to a Christian school, uh, like a private Christian school, and we were reading C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And we had this chapter uh, in that book on God and time. And it starts, if I remember correctly, I think Lewis starts out the chapter saying, this is a chapter you may want to skip. And my English teacher said, you will not be skipping this chapter. You have to read it. And so we're like, sure, of course. Um, I don't remember if I actually read the chapter or not uh, at the time, um, but I remember having this, we had the discussion during class and my teacher, she got really mad because we were just, I don't know, we just didn't seem like we really cared. And she, and she made this statement of like, if you do not see like how crazy this is, like like this idea of God being outside of time, if that's not blowing your mind, then you're not really thinking about it. And that for me actually did blow my mind at that moment. And it had made me feel for the first time in a long time, this is a God that I want to worship. Like this is like, this is a very big God. Uh, and so from there, I just wanted to try to pursue that question at some point in my life when I was actually able to, to do that. Cause when I was in high school, I don't, I don't know anything about time or God or anything. Like, I don't know this stuff. Uh, so when I got to do my PhD, I decided this is exactly what I want to do my topic on. I'm like, this has got to be the research. And so originally, the, the-, the thesis was called In Search of a Timeless God. And by the time I got done with a PhD, I discovered I couldn't find a timeless God because I felt that the concept was incoherent. It didn't, it didn't uh, match with other things I knew to be true about the way the world is, or if Christianity is true, it doesn't seem like it fits with Christianity very well. Uh, and so from there, then I was like, well, okay, what on earth does it mean to say that God's temporal or in time? And so that's the topic of the current book I'm finishing up right now, which is called uh, From Divine Time Maker to Divine Watchmaker. Wow. So what were some of the things that, um, that you couldn't reconcile with the idea, like, Christianity and a timeless God. What were some of the difficulties? Mm -hmm. Well, I, we should probably define them so we can understand like okay. what on earth. The otherwise, we're like, it just mm -hmm. sounds like I'm just making up stuff. Um, so everyone in these debates, they agree that God is an eternal being. Like no one denies God's eternal. Uh, to be eternal means to exist without beginning and without end. And so if you think that God is a necessary being, that God has to exist and cannot fail to exist, then it's going to entail that God exists without beginning, without end. So, so that's not really a terribly interesting claim. The interesting claims are if you think God's timeless or temporal, because what you do is you add some additional claims to that. So if you say God's timeless, you're going to add, um, so you're going to say God exists without beginning and without end. But you're going to say God also exists without temporal location, without temporal extension, and without succession. So the idea is God enjoys all of his life all at once in some sort of timeless present that lacks a before and after. And he doesn't stand in any kind of temporal relations with the universe. So he doesn't exist right now. God does not exist in the past or the future. God is not earlier than World War II. God is not later than World War II. God is not simultaneous with anything. Uh, these are the sort of things you have to say if you want to affirm that God is timeless. Whereas if you say God's temporal, you're going to say God exists without beginning and without end. Because again, he's an eternal being. Mm -hmm. But then you're going to also say that God can undergo succession. God can do one thing and then another. And God can have temporal location. So God exists right now. God did exist in the past. God will exist in the future. So one kind of conflict, there's a bunch of conflicts I could point out between timelessness and anything that any sort of theistic religion would want to say about God. Um, but here's, here's just like a really obvious one. It seems really obvious to say that God exists right now. 
like imagine going to church on Sunday and going, God does not exist right now. And, and people will be like, have you become an atheist, Rebecca? And you'd be like, no, 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 I swear. I swear. Like, I still believe that God exists. He just doesn't exist right now. Did he exist in the mm -hmm. past? No, of course not. Of course not. Will he exist in the future? No, that, that's crazy. No, no, no. Rebecca, how are you not an atheist? You know, like they're just going to be having all these weird, weird questions. Mm. Whereas if God's mm -hmm. temporal, well, of course he exists right now. I mean, like, it's just obvious. Like, so, uh, so those are like, that's one kind of conundrum that at least that pops up. There's lots of other mm. ones, but that's just one to get us started. Okay. And so, um, now let's see if the first question that kind of comes up is the idea that God being temporal is kind of frightening, right? Mm -hmm. Like it kind of makes it sound like God is subject to time in the same way that we are. And that seems to kind of like diminish the idea of him being omnipotent or, mm -hmm. you know, so can you like kind of explain how you see that? Yeah. So let's try to make the problem a little bit worse. So, okay. so some people will try to say that if God's temporal, then, then he's somehow like a prisoner of time. This is usually how the mm -hmm. objection goes. Uh, and I somehow was able to publish this sentence uh, in, a, in a paper. They let me get away with it where I said, God, uh, time is not God's mom. It can't tell him what to do. Mm -hmm. And I do not know how they let me publish that. But, you know, there you go. Um, because mm -hmm. when you look at the different definitions of what time is, none of them are the sort of thing that like, where it really makes sense to talk about God being like a prisoner of it. Mm. So uh, on some accounts, time is just uh, a relationship between events. So just, uh, the, just, just the relationship of before and after that's it. So God not doing anything at all. And then he's like, eh, I think I want to create a universe, big bang, boom. Well, God existed before the big bang and now exists after it. And you're like, oh gosh, he's like a, he's a prisoner of this before and after relation. Like, I don't know what that mm. means to say you're a prisoner of this. Um, another way to try to make the problem is to, is, um, is actually a very ancient kind of view. And you see it a lot in, um, in a lot of like a Hindu thinking, but then you also see it in Isaac Newton, uh, is this idea that time is this eternal uncaused substance. So it really is this thing. It's not just a relationship between events. It's this actual thing. Uh, and in an expl in this this thing that is time explains uh, the flow of moments. It explains the ordering of moments. It explains the existence of moments. It explains why a series of moments is in some kind of like timeline. Mm -hmm. From that, you could talk about well, okay, so God's this eternal, uncaused substance, and then time is also this eternal, uncaused substance. Mm. Well, if you think God creates everything. Well, then he can't create an, a, another eternal uncaused substance because um, that's just incoherent. You can't create an uncreatable thing. Mm -hmm. So then you might go, oh, well, gosh, God's not the creator of everything um, because there's this thing, time, that he didn't create. And so that can cause a problem. Um, but Isaac Newton and, uh, and then some people in the Hindu tradition, um, so someone like uh, Raghunata Shiromani, they have this very easy answer. They just go, well, time's not this separate thing from God. Uh, God is time itself. Like this is mm -hmm. a part of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so so God is this eternal uncaused substance that makes change possible, is the things that uh, is the source of all these moments of time. He is the thing that organizes all these moments into a coherent timeline. So God just is time itself. Um, sounds kind of crazy, but like I said, people like Isaac Newton uh, affirm this sort of view. So it can only be so crazy, I guess. Okay, so in, what is your view on that? I am starting to get really friendly towards this view uh, from Newton. It seemed the more I've written on it, um, that's the big project of the, of the book I'm working on right now, the more plausible it seems to me. But that might just be because I'm going crazy as well. So I don't know. I don't know. Well, I mean, it does, you know, when you start thinking about things with time, it gets a little chaotic, doesn't it? It gets crazy really fast. It really does. So, sure, you know, I'm like, hey, hey, this is, uh, you know, this this old uh, like modern philosophy view, this scientific revolutionary idea of like God being time. Maybe that's uh, maybe that's nuts, but uh, you know, whatever. Sure, lots of things are nuts. Now, so have you had to do a lot of study about time, like from a scientific perspective? Can you talk about that? I, I did for a while, and then I realized that a lot of physics, they're not really talking about time itself. They're talking about measurements. 
they're more interested in clocks. So if you can, if you have certain conditions in place that you can, where you can develop a clock, then they start getting really interested. If you don't have the conditions for developing a clock, or you're just asking like, what exactly is time itself? They don't get terribly interested in those sort of questions. Usually, I mean, there, there are some physicists who are, but uh, they tend to get a little bit uncomfortable. So here'd be an example of this. Um, so at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, there is the Higgs Center for Theoretical Physics. Mm -hmm. And I proposed to do a workshop with, with them. Uh, so I was like, I'll get some philosophers, I'll get some physicists, we'll sit down together and we'll talk about just what is time. And that scared them. They, like their response was, we don't know what time is. That's a philosophical question. Uh, we could talk about problems related to time that we all deal with, but time itself, we don't, we don't know. We can't, we can't deal with that kind of question. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that reaction is very telling. It's very interesting um, because a lot of popularized physics acts like they're talking directly about time. Whereas I think a lot of physicists themselves, they're like, I'm interested in like metric systems. Uh, that's, that's, I think that's more what they're interested in. Okay. So now if like, do you hold the idea that the A theory of time or the B theory of time? Mm, this is a weird debate. I, I normally side with the A theory, but it's really difficult to get a bunch of philosophers of time to agree on exactly what this A theory versus B theory distinction is. Um, which okay. is really annoying. Uh, so what I usually do is I talk in terms of what people are normally interested in. What they're really interested in more often than not is uh, this question about the ontology of time or what moments of time exist. Uh, and there are two really popular views. There's a lot of views you could affirm, but the two most popular are what's called presentism, which says the present, that's the only moment of time that exists. Past, it no longer exists. Future does not yet exist. It's just the present. So that's why presentism. And then eternalism is the other really popular view, which says that all moments of the timeline exist. So past, present, and future, they're all equally real. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually when people say B theory, that's what they're thinking of. And usually when people talk about the A theory, they're usually thinking of presentism. But things are actually more complicated than that, so it gets messy. So I usually just talk about presentism and eternalism because that's normally what people are really wanting to get at instead of talking about these weird issues about philosophy of language and, and how to talk about talking about time and, and all this kind of crazy stuff. So yeah, so I want to go with presentism. I want to go, that's that's just the most obvious way. It's the obvious truth. Um, and just say eternalism just makes no sense. Or, or it has all these undesirable consequences is usually how I want to go. Okay. Now, what are the things that have led you to, to, you know, get rid of the idea of a timeless God and really embrace the idea that, you know, God is temporal? Mm -hmm. So, so the, so the first book, the end of the timeless God, here's the big idea is to go, okay, imagine that something like Christianity is true. Mm -hmm can you really reconcile the idea of a timeless God with all the different things that Christians want to say, and then look at different ontologies of time, look at presentism and eternalism and see, does it fit with any of these things? And the more I've studied it and the more I've worked on it, the more I just keep finding problem after problem. So here's just one. So Christians want to affirm the doctrine of creation out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And so here's what this doctrine is traditionally said. So it traditionally says that the universe has a beginning, an absolute beginning. There's some sort of prior state of affairs where God exists all alone. There's nothing else but God. And so God did not create the universe out of any sort of material stuff because there was no stuff because before the universe, it was just God. Mm -hmm. So you've got God all alone and then God with a universe. Now that looks like a before and an after. That mm -hmm. looks like God's not doing anything and then he's doing something. So it looks like there's a change in the life of God. Mm -hmm. Well, if God's timeless, you can't have that. There can't be God doing nothing and then doing something. You can't have God, you know, just having way, a way things are and then them being differently. Like that doesn't work because you can't have any succession in a timeless life. And I'm like, well, that's a really serious problem. And so I was like, well, but you know, there's a lot of, a lot of all these dead people that we like, uh, we talk about uh, all the great theologians from the past, like, you know, surely they would have figured something out. They're really smart. They're really bright. So I'm like, okay, well, let's look at what they said. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of the things they say, it's just them stamping their foot on the ground saying, I know it looks like God changes, but he doesn't. And mm. you're like, okay, okay. 
And then the really, the really crazy claim, here's a really crazy claim. Um, you get from St. Augustine, you get in Peter Lombard, you get in Thomas Aquinas and a bunch of these others. They'll say that God's not really related to the universe. Mm. And that seems a bit odd on the surface because you won't, we often talk about what exactly is God's relationship to the universe. You know, God's omnipresent. So he's like, you know, he's everywhere. Well, but he's not really related to the universe. What's that? How, how, how on earth does that work? And you have to start saying some really bizarre claims. So here are two examples of real relationships. Uh, one real relationship is if I know that you exist uh, or I just know anything, uh, like mm -hmm. my relationship to knowing that I'm sitting on a chair, mm -hmm. uh, like I know the chair. That's a real relationship. Uh, the causal relationship is also another uh, real relationship, according to all of these dead thinkers. Uh, if you cause something, you're really related to the thing that you cause to exist. Well, if God caused the universe to exist, because Augustine and Aquinas, they both want to say that, and God knows that the universe exists because they want to say he's omniscient, but then they're like, oh, but he's not really related. And I'm like, well, then you can't say he caused the universe to exist, and you can't say he knows mm -hmm. that the universe exists. So you've denied that God's a creator, and it seems like you've denied that God's omniscient. This is a very serious mm. problem. That's just a very serious incoherence. Okay. So now what is your understanding about how God interacts with time? Mm -hmm. So on my sort of now like kind of crazy view where God is time itself. So, so, so time is this thing that makes change possible. And it's the source of all the different moments of time. And it's the thing that organizes moments into a coherent timeline. If I want to say that's God, God's doing all of that. So I want to say God's the thing that makes change possible because God's a being with um, all like maximal power and freedom. So God's the thing that is the kind of thing that can change. And so he's the thing that can explain why any other change is possible because he can create stuff mm -hmm. and create things that are possible uh, that are like capable of undergoing change as well. Uh, he's the thing that is the source of moments because a moment of time is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. So God all alone, all by himself, not creating anything. That's the way things are. And since God has free will, well, things could be subsequently otherwise because he could freely exercise his power to do something. So God explains the very nature of God and the actions of God explain why there are different moments of time and why does a particular series of moments come about? Well, it's because those are the ones that God wanted to bring about. Mm -hmm. So as I'm seeing it now, God's interaction with time, it's, it's more of, well, God is time itself. And then you start explaining how moments of time come into existence and then how we get the particular ordering of events that we have. And, and so God's mm -hmm. going to be the, the thing that explains all of that. Um, there's other things that are going to explain some of the story. Because if God wants to create creatures who have freedom, they're going to contribute to the way things develop but but that's ultimately up to god if that's what god wants to do does he want to create a universe where creatures have free will or does he want to create a universe where nobody has any free will other than himself you know that's up to god to to figure out that sort of stuff out well what is your understanding of like do you believe that god has given creatures free will and how does that interact with god's knowledge and god's foreknowledge or does mm -hmm. god have foreknowledge I want to say God has foreknowledge, um, but there's a lot of problems. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll try to get into some of these, I guess. Okay. So if you, so, freedom. I take freedom to be you have free will if you have the um, if you're the source of your actions. Mm -hmm. Like so, no one else made you do it. Like you're the one who did whatever action mm -hmm. you're doing. Uh, so you're the author of your actions, and you had the ability to do otherwise. Those are two very kind of common conditions that a lot of people, not everyone, um, but a lot of people do want to say those are kind of mm -hmm. conditions for what it means to have free will. Sometimes people want to get rid of um, the ability to do otherwise. I really like that ability to do otherwise because I, I, I just can't understand freedom without that. So it seems to me that if God wants to create creatures with free will, mm -hmm. then he's going to create creatures that have the ability to be the source of their own actions and have the ability to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Um. The reason I think that God would create a universe like that, there's a few different reasons why I think God would do that. One is if God wants to create creatures who can develop a moral character that actually has real moral value. Mm -hmm. 
then he needs to create creatures who can perform significantly free actions. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they can't develop a moral character. If if God's just pulling all the strings, you know, you're not developing a morally significant character. Um, another kind of reason might be maybe God wants to create creatures that he could be friends with. And there's a strong biblical uh, line of thought that says these sorts mm -hmm. of things. You see this a lot in the Gospel of John. And well, what does it mean to be friends with someone? Uh, what does it take to be friends with someone? If those other people don't have free will, are you really going to have genuine friendship with them? Like, you know, like mm -hmm. I just force you to like me uh, because I program you to like me. That's a mm -hmm. real genuine friendship there, right? You know, um, so these would be some kind of reasons I would think that God would create a universe with uh, creatures that have free will. Mm -hmm. From there, you get some weird stuff, though, about how, uh, well, can there be foreknowledge? And then um, would you still have free will if there is foreknowledge? But I don't know where you want to go with the conversation just yet. So uh, I'll just pause for a second. Okay. Well, do you think God being temporal, um, he can still have that foreknowledge as a temporal being? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's a couple options you could have. Um, one, you could be a theological determinist. So something like a Calvinist, something kind of like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so God could just be like, do I want to create a universe? I do. I do. Um, I want to make sure that the universe goes exactly according to plan. Mm -hmm. Like nothing's going to screw up. I don't want anything going like, you know, like all wacky and crazy. How else am I going to do that? Well, the only way I can do that is by causally determining everything that happens. Mm -hmm. and this is, you can see some of these kind of arguments from Calvinists sometimes. Uh, and so then you can be like, yeah, okay. Well then at the next moment, God's like, okay, here's a universe. At the next moment, he's causally, you know, bringing about certain things. The moment after that, he causally brings about other things and so on and so on and so on forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm. So you could be a temporalist and be a Calvinist and say, God's like, mm -hmm. just causing everything that happens. And he's got all the foreknowledge you could ever want because he knows he's going to cause all these things to happen. Mm -hmm. You might think that doesn't give you any free will. The Calvinist is going to disagree because they're going to say, well, look, I freedom is, of course, you know, you're like you're doing your own actions. But the like the really important thing about freedom is that you always do what you want to do. Uh, and you do the things you want to do on the Calvinist story. Mm. Uh, maybe it's because God causes you to want those things. And then, you know, God causes you to want to do those things. And then God causes you to do those things. But you still okay. do the things you want to do. Right. So you got freedom. You got freedom. Okay. I swear. Like that's That's the way the Calvinist is going to go. Okay, and if you reject Calvinism and you're like, but you still want to hold on to the idea that God has foreknowledge, mm -hmm. how, what would you? There's, there's a couple options. One is this this view called simple foreknowledge. Um, I really this I struggle to take this one seriously, but um, I've got friends who hold it, so I'll I'll do my best to try to take it seriously for a second. So the claim is, before God creates the universe, He doesn't know what's going to happen. Um, cause he's not made any decisions. The Calvinist says the same thing too. Before God decides mm -hmm. to do anything, he doesn't know what's going to happen. Um, but, but on Calvinism, God decides he comes up with an exhaustive plan and he decides mm -hmm. I'm going to bring that plan about. And so he, then he, then that's how he knows the future. Cause he knows mm -hmm. what his plan is on the simple foreknowledge view. God doesn't know what's going to happen until he decides to go make the universe go bang. And then at that, mm -hmm. at the moment after that, then he knows how the entire future is going to go. Mm -hmm. And so this is called the simple foreknowledge view. So God's like, okay, I'm going to push this button and the big bang is going to happen. And then I'll open my eyes and see, oh, that's what's going to happen in the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. You're going to have to die on a cross. Uh, yeah, we, we didn't expect that one, but you know, hey, there you go. This is what's happening. The main objection to this view is it is providentially useless because God can't actually exhibit any kind of control over what's going to come about in the future because he just flips mm -hmm. the switch on the universe. The universe comes into existence like he wanted it to. But then what happens after that? Well, he just finds himself then with a, a story of this is how things are going to go and mm -hmm. a story, complete story of what he himself is going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's too late now to try to providentially arrange things because the story has already been written of what's going to happen. Mm hmm. So it's it's kind of yeah it's I don't, I don't know how to get confidence on that it seems it seems really mm -hmm. bad um, there are some weird things you can do where you could try to introduce what are called these uh, causal loops so it's sort of mm -hmm. like some weird time travel stuff you could kind of try to do um, or ex have some weird like ex explanatory circles in there mm -hmm. and that gets really complicated and I think if I have to do stuff like that then I've just kind of 
lost the plot of doing Christian theology. If I have to start like, uh, you know, appealing to like time travel stuff or things like that to explain things. Um, I like time travel stories. Those are fun. They're interesting. But if I have to appeal to that to do, to like do my theology, then I, I think I've just, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'm really doing serious work anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's a bit harsh, but but that's how I feel. Oh. So yeah. Now, what do you think about, because I've been an open theist for a long time. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts about open theism. And for those who may not have heard of that before, mm-hmm. it's just kind of the idea that God knows all the possibilities for the future, but you know, the future isn't, we, the future hasn't happened yet. And so there's possibilities there that, um, you know, God is not aware of that. He doesn't have complete foreknowledge, but not to say he doesn't have any foreknowledge because he does have total awareness of like, you know, everything that's exists now. So that gives him an indicators toward the future. And also he's a still a, powerful actor in the universe. So there's things that he can make happen if he wants to. Um, So, you know, it's not that he has no foreknowledge, but that his foreknowledge is limited. So is that a good description of open theism or would you add anything to that? I'd add a little bit of nuance here. So open theists still want to say God knows all the things there are to know. Um, But since the future is completely open, there's just nothing there to know. So what I will do tomorrow that's just an, uh, there's just no fact of the matter about what I will do. Mm-hmm. So God knows all the facts there are to the world. So he's omniscient, but mm-hmm. there's just some stuff. There's, there's nothing there to know. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. So when, so the open theist will say before God creates the universe, he sees all the possibilities. And mm-hmm. that's the Calvinist says that the people who are interested in Molinism, they're going to say that too. So the open theist is like, Hey, being super traditional. Um, I'm just going to say that uh, Molinism is false. If you're an open theist, you're going to be like, there's none of this weird thing called middle knowledge. Uh, and then they'll go, the Calvinists, you know, you guys are wrong. Like God could create a universe that's fully determined if he wants, but he couldn't get anybody with freedom. And since God really wants creatures with freedom, then his only option is to create an open universe where the future is not fully settled. Uh, and then from there, the open theist can say several things. So the open theist can say, God knows all the possibilities, all the possible timelines of how mm-hmm. things could unfold. Um, and he also knows the probability of which one will most likely come about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the final thing they can say is before God creates a universe, he comes up with an exhaustive contingency plan mm-hmm. for if uh, Rebecca does this and if Ryan does that, well, then I'm going to do this. So God's got a, a, like an exhaustive contingency plan for how uh, to ensure that whatever his ultimate purpose is for creation, he's going to be able to get that end result. Mm-hmm. Some open theists don't like that idea of like the idea of God guaranteeing. Um, but when I've traced down like kind of the history of open theism and looking at some of the statements from people who say God can't guarantee things, I also have quotes from them saying God does guarantee things. And I'm like, it seems mm. a bit, a bit cheeky, mm-hmm. but okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the view. There's some problems that people will have. Uh, w- the main problem that I've published on is this objection that if God doesn't know the future, like exhaustively, mm-hmm. then, um, he could really, uh, bodge things up. Um, it's a, a British term. Um, it just means like kind of screwing things up. So the idea is before God creates a universe, he might intend to get particular results mm-hmm. and he would really screw things up like really badly if he didn't get those results. So if you intend to perform some kind of action, um, like, you know, like I'm going to make a, I'm going to make a, a, like a pizza later and then I open up the oven and it's like all falling apart. It's completely screwed up. You'd be like, Oh, I really bodged that one up. Well, maybe God could do the same thing with the universe. God's like, I'm going to create a universe. I'm going to keep these creatures. They're going to like, like flourish. They're going to like grow into like value and virtue and I'll enter into friendship. It's going to be really great. And it creates a universe and it just, it just, it just goes to hell. It just, it just falls apart entirely. Uh, and, and so you're like, oh gosh, that was what well done God, you know, like, you know, great and glorious being, uh, you know, like, whew. Uh, um, so that like, that's kind of the, the way the objection goes is like, God could really screw things up because he doesn't know the future. Um, now, I don't think that's really accurate because if God really does have this exhaustive contingency plan, it seems that he's going to be able to factor in all the possible ways things could go wrong. And he's going to have some kind of, it seems like he would have these, what, we, um, what my wife and I in a paper we published recently are called risk management systems. Uh, so my wife is a molecular biologist and 
what she did was she was looking at all these different uh, risk management systems within the molecular world. So when you're looking at DNA and RNA, um, as your uh, DNA is getting uh, copied uh, and, and read, um, there are a lot of mistakes that can go wrong, like tons and tons of mistakes. The number of mistakes mm -hmm. that made me so anxious and nervous going, the potential for my DNA to get screwed up at any given moment seems really, really high. That's a whole gosh, you know, and I can just feel like you know, getting an ulcer, and then maybe you know because I, um, then my wife's like, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, more, okay, like it's it's fine, because there's all these different mechanisms within your body to identify mistakes that are made while your DNA and your RNA are being replicated, and to to destroy all the mistakes or to fix them and repair them. There's this huge vast network of all these kind of like mechanisms in the biological world to ensure that. Uh, evolution is somewhat stable uh, and stable in a way that allows for some kind of flexibility and autonomy. And I was like, you know what? That sounds like exactly what the open theist should say. So if an open theist says, what kind of universe would God create? Well, it seems like he would create a universe where there's all these risk management systems that anticipate that a bunch of mistakes mm -hmm. will be made and that have some kind of repair mechanisms that will come along and repair these things. Uh, so... It's kind of like, okay, well, if, if we can see this kind of vast network of things going on in the biological world, shouldn't we expect God to do something like that on the mm -hmm. spiritual level too? Like, surely the open theist God's not a complete idiot. Like, he's not going to completely bodge things up in this sort of way that everybody was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the idea of what my wife and I were doing in this in this paper that we uh, published a little while ago, is just going, I think we can help the open theist out a lot here. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> well, now, see, for me, open theism helps me a little bit with the problem of evil because you know, it's, it, it, you know, it's okay that things haven't gone according to plan, you know, that, you, okay, you know, God has a ultimate plan for restoration. He knows that that plan is going to happen, but it kind of helps with the idea that, hey, you know, God didn't plan for these evil things to happen. So how do you feel about that? I think that's right. So, when um, when I was trying to figure out this whole idea of God bodging or screwing up, I was I was looking at some different open theist statements to see, well, what exactly was God planning? Uh, mm -hmm. And so John Sanders um, has this book called The God Who Risks. And that's been kind of um, mm. the source of a lot of these objections that God's too risky, that it's irresponsible. Mm. Uh, and so, some, so sometimes I'm like, I understand this idea of risk, but it seems like it's created all these, uh, at least a, a public uh, relations kind of problem, you know, like kind of branding issue or something. <laughs> so, so like, so John Sanders, he has this statement of going, sure, like, so God, uh, there's a sense in which you could say, like, God doesn't want any of the, all this bad stuff to happen. Like, that's, that's very true. But there's another sense in which you could say, well, God planned on creating creatures with freedom, knowing full well that they could reject him. Mm -hmm. And so he succeeded in creating beings who really do have the genuine power to reject him mm -hmm. and do have the genuine power to do bad things. So mm -hmm. God did succeed at at least this initial plan of creating beings like that. Right. Um, whether or not God's going to pull off the whole uh, plan of entering into friendships and giving people everlasting life, uh, not well, a good everlasting life, I should say, because you could have a really terrible, uh, damned everlasting life, and that's not so much fun. Um, but like a good everlasting life, if mm -hmm. God could pull that off, I mean, that's the one we're really interested in. But the open theist, yeah, there's a sense in which they can say, like, yeah, like God knew, created, he created a universe intentionally with beings that could reject him. Mm -hmm. And that's what he got. So there's no surprises there. Um, so mm -hmm. might, it might, it seems like it could help a bit with, with the problem of evil in the sense that it's not like God specifically planned, yeah, I want to give you cancer at this point. Uh, and I want a war over here at this point. You know, like you don't have to say anything like that. Um, like you might have to on like a Calvinist or a Molinist kind of view. So it seems like it could help mm -hmm. alleviate some uh, pressure points with the problem of evil. What do you think about the Molinist view, by the way? This is just, a, I want to mm -hmm. come back to open theism, but I want to sure, sure. just, what do you think about Molinism? I like it a lot. Um, there's just, like, this is the view that I, I still want to cling on to. But there's these things called the grounding objection that um, that worry me a bit. So the yeah, so yeah. So Can go ahead, you go briefly thinking. explain Molinism for those yes, who are not familiar? Because we with didn't it. do that mm -hmm. yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Molinism. So okay. So you had like the Calvinist story where it says before mm -hmm. God creates, before God decides to do anything, mm -hmm. He doesn't know what's going to happen because He hasn't decided anything. And the Molinist says, yes, that's exactly right. Uh, and then the Calvinist will go, "There's all these logically possible worlds that I could create." 
And the Molinus says, mm -hmm, yeah, 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 give me a god that's good at that too. But then the Molinus wants to add this extra little thing, which is there are certain logically possible worlds. Um, there's a subset of those, which are called feasible worlds. Uh, worlds where God knows what you would do in any possible circumstance you might be placed in. So what you would you do with your actual genuine, like libertarian freedom is the idea. He knows what you would do. Because there are logically possible worlds where, um, you know, I wear a blue shirt today instead of a black shirt. Uh, that's a logically possible world. But it might be the case that there's no feasible world where I do that because it's just like, yeah, I just, there's no situation in which Ryan would go and you know, be like, yeah, I really like that blue shirt. Like, that's, you know, that's just not, this is Ryan just wouldn't do that. He wouldn't do that with his own free will. And that's, that's kind of the idea on Molinism. So God knows what you would do in any possible circumstance and is able to figure out the kind of universe that he wants, the kind of timeline that he wants, mm -hmm. um, that supposedly preserves all your libertarian freedom. So you really do have the ability to do otherwise. Um, but you, and God doesn't cause you to do the things that you do, mm -hmm. but God's able to still have this like very strong providential control and say, here's an exhaustive timeline of exactly how things are going to go. This is what creatures are going to do with their free will. I know that. And I've got my responses of what I'm going to do in that, in that timeline. That's the one I want. I'm going to create that universe. Here we go. And so he knows exactly how things are going to go. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the Molinist story. So it's supposed to give and you the best of both worlds. And what's the problem with that? You said there's a grounding problem. So the, the worry is how does God know what you would do in every possible circumstance that you would be placed in? Uh, what grounds the truth of that? This is the kind of a, 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 the way the objection typically goes. The, the difficulty I find with answering the objection is actually a difficulty with trying to understand what the objection is. Because this idea of grounding or what's called truth making um, has this kind of an initial intuitive pull of what makes it true that Ryan is talking to Rebecca right now. Well, the fact that here you and I are talking. And you're like, oh, okay, well, mm -hmm. there's a truth maker. Okay, there's these two people, they're talking. There you go. Well, before God creates us, what would make it true that Ryan and Rebecca will talk or would talk? Because we don't exist. We're not there to like make those mm -hmm. things true. And so you're like, oh, well, crap. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what, what, what could make those things true? Ugh, there's, you know, you can't point to anything. Well, this is where things get weird. Um, in, the, in the literature on truth making, you can point to all sorts of like crazy weird objects to ground truths about whatever you want. Uh, you can point to the essence of Ryan and the essence of Rebecca. Uh, that could ground things. Um, you could just say, eh, they don't need to be grounded. And uh, they're just like any other kind of like a, like a, like counterfactuals or like truths about what, what, what could be the case or would be the case. You don't need anything to ground those. They just are true. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe this whole idea of truth making is just false from the start. Uh, and I actually do think, um, that's right. I do think the idea of truth making is, is just, uh, false because you get all sorts of weird stuff really fast. And I'm like, Ooh, okay. So this whole idea of like, it just, it's very, basically it's the objection seems intuitive at first. But then trying to sort through the weeds to figure out exactly what the problem is, you, you, I discover problems for the, the theory that's causing the problem in the first place. I don't know where that gets me, though. I don't know if that leaves me with, hey, my Molinism is like super secure and safe. Or if it just leaves me just going, I don't, I don't know what to say. And I think that's where it leaves me, actually, is just go, I don't know what to say. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So that's not satisfying, but yeah, I don't know. No, I mean, I, 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 I haven't liked the idea of Molinism, but it's interesting because I, I hear Christian philosophers seem to like it. Like, you know, there's a lot of Christian philosophers that think Molinism is great. So there are, and there are a lot of people who really hate it too. It's, it's a very divisive topic. It's fascinating to see people just divide over it and just go, oh, that's crazy. And I'm like, but you love libertarian freedom and you love the idea that God knows the future. Yeah, but I just can't get with Molinism. I'm like, oh, okay. And then some others who are just like, nope, got to be a Calvinist. And then, oh, nope, got to be an open theist. So it's, yeah, it's people are all over the map on this. It's, yeah. Okay. Well, you know, back to open theism, mm -hmm. one objection that my son brought up to it is, you know, he said, look, look, if God knows everything that exists right now, like if it, he knows everything that's in the mind of the human, everything that's like, you know, everything that is to be known right now, then why wouldn't he know all the future choices that we would make? Like, because he would know us so well. So then 
you know, he, it seems that he would have foreknowledge. What's your thought about that? I, I think that's a good objection. Um, this is something my wife and I have thought about a lot when we were working on, on open theism uh, for, for a paper. So we've got all these worries about, we don't want like Google or Cambridge Analytica or these other like corporations to get all of our data for what we're doing on social media. Why? Because then they could like re make really good predictions about what we're going to do. Mm. And we get super terrified about that um, mm -hmm. because these, it, but the, we're talking about just like uh, artificial intelligence, which is not really that intelligent. And we're talking about a bunch of like people in these boardrooms and stuff using that data. Mm -hmm. If they're able to make really good predictions to figure out how to manipulate us to vote certain ways, mm -hmm. I mean, surely someone like God would have even better predictive power is what it seems mm -hmm. to us. But I guess, you, but here's what the open theist wants to say, though, um, that I'm not fully sold on. They'll want to say, okay, sure, it's predictive power, but it's not like certain. Like you couldn't really get a whole bunch of certainties about everything um, because you do have genuine freedom, uh, which means like it really is the case. You could, you know, maybe do something just like completely like random. The guy just would be like, whoa, I knew that was a possibility, but I thought the probability of that was really, really low. Well, mm -hmm. that surprised me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't I just don't I, I guess I find it implausible that God could really be that surprised um, because it seems like he would have such great predictive power how far into the future that extends is what I don't know I, I don't know because knowing everything that happens right now I, I think that would only give you like so much like you predict uh, like I think you could only probably predict so far um, but I you know I don't know I don't know but it does seem well, to me that he would predict a lot more. Well, what is your working theory? Like your practical daily life and thinking about God and his, like whether he has foreknowledge or not, do you engage with God as if he knows the future? So I go back and forth on this. Cause like I said, I want, I really want to be a Molinist. And so I want to really go know like God's got this plan. Things are going to go some particular way. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea what that plan is. I don't know what way it's going to go. So I just have, I'm just stuck with being an individual who doesn't know the future. Um, and, and actually, that's actually learned that sort of attitude of that's, that's how you should pray and think um, from J.I. Packer, who's a Calvinist um, from his mm -hmm. devotional book, Knowing God. So he's got this chapter on providence and foreknowledge. And he's like, the absolute mistake you would always make in your spiritual life is thinking that just because you're a Christian, therefore, you know, you've, and you've got the Holy Spirit, like somehow you're going to have these deep insights to exactly how the future is going to go. You you know God's plan. He's like, that's, that's going to be a disaster. That's going to end badly for you. Mm. And I've seen that in my own personal life of, of thinking I knew exactly what God's plan was. And when it blew up in my face, you know, being very angry at God going, I can't believe that I thought you had a plan. You betrayed me. And then going, mm. why on earth did I think I knew that plan? How could I have thought I knew that plan? What was, where did I get this mm. crap from? I don't know. Um, so that's kind of my attitude is to go, I, I want to say God's in control. I want to say God has a plan, but I, whew, I'll be damned if I know what it is. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have a clue. Hmm. Well, how do you deal with how that relates to evil? And like, do you see the evil things that happen in the world as part of God's plan or as like resistance to what God would want? How would you see this? I think everyone calvinist molinist open theist has to say that um i'll start with the way the open theist why i think that open theist even has to say this to some extent so keith ward is an open theist and and he says when god creates a universe he knows that it's inevitable that evil will take place because the kind of beings that he's creating these beings with all this kind of freedom god knows it's going to take place and uh, richard swinburne makes similar kind of claims uh and so it's like okay so everybody uh, knows that it's inevitable that evils of some sort will take place. So I feel like open theists or anybody who wants to say God knows the future, they're in the same boat in that regard. Like God knows when he creates this universe, there's some evil that's going to take place because he knows he's creating mm -hmm. a universe where evil is possible, highly likely, or inevitable. So mm -hmm. I'm like, ooh, okay. So which view of providence I go with doesn't seem like it really helps me on that point. Mm-hmm knowing that God will has a plan for that though, that he's got good reasons for it. That I feel like I could say um, the same kind of story I'd want to say on Molinism, I could say on open theism. 
So God's mm -hmm. reasons are things like, well, he wants to create a universe with stable laws of nature. That's a precondition for creating beings with some kind of robust freedom where they really mm -hmm. can do A or not A. And they need to be able to have that kind of freedom in order to develop their own moral character and in order mm -hmm. to create genuine, meaningful relationships with other creatures and with God. These are all mm -hmm. the preconditions you need uh, mm -hmm. for those sort of things. And that leaves open the inevitability of evil. I don't like mm -hmm. it, but it explains things. It makes a lot of sense. It, it seems like really rational to me of like, if you want to create a universe where you can get creatures who really can do all these things, that's the kind of universe you're going to have to create. Mm -hmm. So I can't, so I, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to me that open theism or Molinism really helps either way, because I think you're going to be saying basically the same thing. And then you're also going to, I think, be able to say on both views, God's going to guarantee you can get the, the, a good result in the end because of, because of the way he weaves everything together in his plan. Mm -hmm. So I can't figure out a way to really decisively tip me um, away from my Molinism and in favor of open theism on something like the problem of evil. Okay. Well, now this is really interesting because, um, you know, I, I really thought as we were talking, this divine foreknowledge was going to be very interconnected with this idea of God being temporal or atemporal. And it doesn't seem like for you it is. So why do people need to embrace this idea? Do you think they need to, of God being temporal? Like what, you know, mm -hmm. why is this important? Why did you write this book? Like saying, we've got to get rid of this, you know, get rid of the timeless God. Yeah. I've had a bunch of open theists ask me this question because the the first book, okay. I don't really talk about foreknowledge at all. Uh, and okay. I had several different open theist uh, scholars go, why'd you ignore that issue? And I'm like, because I had identified so many problems. I didn't need to talk about it. And they're like, yeah, that's fair. Um, so, so that's the, that's the, that really is it. It's just going, do you want a coherent view of God and the God world relationship? Uh, mm -hmm. I think is, is the big question. And if you do, then I don't think you can embrace timelessness because you're not going to be able to get a coherent story of how God could exist without a universe and then exist with a universe. So you're not going to get creation uh, out of nothing. Mm -hmm. You can't make sense of that. Um, you can't make sense of God being omnipresent to the universe because mm -hmm. you're going to have to say he doesn't exist right now, but, he, mm -hmm. but he's, 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 he's everywhere. All, you know, you're like, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But he doesn't exist right now. Well, no, that's, that seems nuts. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can get an incarnation. You can't make sense mm -hmm. of the claim that from all eternity, God, the son was a particular way. And then in the fullness of time, he took on human flesh. That's a change. That's a clear change in mm -hmm. the life of God. Uh, I don't think you can make sense of that uh, on, on timelessness. So it's these kinds of problems that make me go, if you want a coherent, if Christianity is possibly true, it needs to be coherent. If you mm -hmm. put timelessness into the mix, then Christianity is going to be incoherent. So it's not, so it could not possibly be true. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's going to, so I think that'd be a serious problem for Christianity. And then I could say the same thing about like Judaism or Islam or Hinduism and be like, well, look, you know, mm -hmm. you've got all these kind of claims about God creating universes, about God interacting with them in various ways. If God's timeless, there's no coherent story to tell about how that works. So if anything like Hinduism, if anything like Christianity, if mm -hmm. anything like Judaism, Islam is true, woo, you can't have this timeless God. Like I, I really, that's, that's kind of how I see it. Now, um, but so I saw that you wrote something, but I haven't read it yet. And I'm very interested in it though, about God and emotion. Mm -hmm. So is this also connected to like the temporal versus timeless view of God where like, you know, cause I've heard like some philosophers say, well, God can't have emotions because then that's like a change in state or something like that. And so mm -hmm. is this all connected to the timelessness too? Yeah, I've written um, at least one paper on that topic. So, so yeah, okay. So let me f first say a bit about emotions, and then we can talk about how mm -hmm. you get some problems really quickly uh, if you want to introduce timelessness into the story. Um, so, an emotion is a felt evaluation of the situation. So, mm -hmm. your emotions are always um, about something. They're representing the way the world is being a particular way. Uh, so, if you're having a conversation with your son. Uh, and it's like a really like touching moment, you know, you're representing that moment is like, this is a touching moment. And then there's something that feels like have that evaluation. Uh, and this is just kind of the way emotions uh, work in general. And the traditional view is that God does have emotions, um, but there's only a certain range of emotions that God could have. 
so God is going to be in a state of pure, undisturbed happiness, is the way the traditional view says. Uh, and so God can have any emotion that's consistent with being perfectly rational, because you don't want God having like irrational emotions, because sometimes we have very irrational emotions. Sometimes their emotions are rational, but sometimes they're irrational. You'd be like, well, God can't have those. He can't have irrational emotions. And then God can have any emotion that's consistent with his perfect moral goodness, because you don't want God having like immoral emotions, like being like, like really greedy or lusty or anything like that. You don't have any of that. But then he also has to have this, um, his emotions have to be consistent with this perfect, like perfect, pure, undisturbed happiness. Also, it has to be the case that God's emotions are grounded entirely in himself on the traditional view. His emotions cannot be uh, reactions to or grounded in or based on or because of anything outside of himself. Mm -hmm. So God's perfectly happy because he knows himself and he's in a perfect relationship with the greatest good, which is himself. And so that's why he's perfectly happy. Um, the more, I guess I'll say contemporary view, it's only somewhat contemporary, is to say that God can have any emotion that's perfectly rational and perfectly good, but sometimes the perfectly good and rational thing to emotion to have is to be upset. So when the mm -hmm. Holocaust is happening, God's upset. Mm -hmm. Like it, it seems really gross and perverse to say God is in the state of pure undisturbed bliss while the Holocaust is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, because you might go, are you just not aware of what's happening, God? Mm -hmm. uh, or do you just not care? Like what's what's going on here? That seems just an immoral emotional response to mm -hmm. have. Uh, and Thomas Aquinas makes a similar kind of statement. He, he makes it about humans. He doesn't make it about God though. Um, he says, if you're a virtuous person, like the perfectly virtuous person is upset by witnessing something really awful, really evil. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're not upset, either you're really ignorant, like you don't really understand the evil in the situation, Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you're just kind of dumb, um, or mm -hmm. maybe you're just a really vicious, awful person, you know? Mm -hmm. But then when he talks about God being perfectly virtuous, and then he's like, God's always in a state of perfect happiness. And you go, look at the world. God's always mm -hmm. in a state of, per is God ignorant? Is God just kind of dumb? Mm -hmm. Is God really vicious? And Aquinas doesn't see the problem. He doesn't see the, no one pointed out the, the contradiction there. Mm -hmm. So I want to go, whew, yeah, that's a serious problem. Let's make sure that God has, you know, emotions that are actually about the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that are appropriately and really fit the way the world is. Mm -hmm. Here's where the time stuff comes in. Imagine you want to say God's timeless. Mm -hmm. So God is having emotional responses to, I guess you could say everything that happens in time, um, but he has them all at once in his timeless present. Uh, and so he's like really, really upset about the mm -hmm. Holocaust because the Holocaust is really upsetting. You get to heaven. And you're like, God, I'm so excited to be here. Like, how's it going? And he's like, I'm still pretty upset about the, you know, the way the last like several thousand years have gone. And you're like, well, that's in the past. And he's like, yeah, but I, you know, I'm timelessly upset about this. And you're like, okay, this is a bit of a downer. I, you know, I thought this was gonna be like a really cool place to be. And like, like God's such a big party pooper. Like, this is awful, it's terrible. Um, so yeah, you get these kind of yeah. problems if, uh, you know, if God's timeless and he's, and he's got actual emotions that are about the world in a meaningful way. Okay, so embracing the temporal view means God can have an emotion at a particular time and then he can have a different emotion um like when things get better or yeah exactly because like I mean think about some bad stuff that's happened in your life at some point you want to go it's time to move on like it's time to get over it um you know I stubbed my toe last night it was terrible it's awful but like you know it's time to move on it's time to get over it you know but if God's still like it like eternally upset about you know stubbing a toe you want to be like are you ever going to get over this? It seems like the rational thing to do would be to get over this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's what I want to say. Like, yeah, the rational thing to do is to get over it. And God being perfectly rational, he's going to get over it because he knows what time it is now. He knows the way the world is right now. He knows it's time to move on. Now, so one thing that we haven't really talked about too much is just how, like, where we can see this timelessness versus temporality as God is presented in the Bible. So mm -hmm. um, does this, does how God is presented, is, is this like rejection of the timeless God mostly philosophical or is it also biblical? And if so, like what about God's interactions in the Bible gives you the idea that he's temporal? Yeah, it should be both philosophical and biblical. Um, when I look at the history of Christian thought, 
oftentimes I get this impression that what the Bible has to say doesn't really influence the doctrine of God very much. Um, people usually hate it when I say that, but then I'm like, here's all these things that literally describes God this way and this way and this way, and that plays no role in your thinking about God. So here's a great example of this. All of the biblical terms for eternity are temporal terms, every single one of them. They're all temporal terms. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are all terms that describe literally a long amount of time. So mm -hmm. when you look at Psalm 90, verse 2, it uses mm -hmm. this Hebrew word olam. I don't know how to pronounce Hebrew words, so I probably mispronounced that. Mm -hmm. um, but the Hebrew word olam literally just means perpetual duration for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And it uses the word twice there, which is a common formula in the Old Testament to de designate a particular stretch of time. Uh, so, they'll, so you'll see this kind of like, from the days of King David to the days of like, you know, King so-and-so, like you'll see this often. So it's like this sort of like from to formula you see in the Old Testament. When you get to Psalm 90 verse two, it says from Olam to Olam. So before God creates the universe, before the mountains and the earth, before the heavens, anything of that existed, before it was formed, from eternity for eternity or from a very long time to mm -hmm. a very long time, there was God. And so it's, it's it's, it's just temporal through and through that description right there. Uh, it's using temporal mm -hmm. words and it's talking and it's using this, this way of dividing up a stretch of time, uh, of the two mm -hmm. from formula. So you're like, Oh, okay. And then that's, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. All of the, all the old Testament words, all the new Testament words for eternity are temporal terms. Um, this is a very common claim from new Testament, and old Testament scholars, but yet for some reason, the history of Christian thought, they've been aware of this problem. Um, this is something I point out in the, the book, The End of the Timeless God, is there's different people. They, they go and they look and they're like, yep, all those words are temporal. Mm. Why is it the case that God describes himself in the Bible as temporal when we really know he's timeless? That becomes the big question mm. that you see people ask throughout church history. Uh, and here's the answer. Uh, you're dumb. You're stupid. Like, you just can't understand what it means for God to be timeless. Mm. Uh, and because you're so dumb and stupid, the Holy Spirit knows this. The Holy Spirit knows this. Knows you're an idiot. Knows you're a child. <laughs> Usually they say child. Um, they, don't, they don't talk about you being an idiot. Uh, you're, you're such a child. You're such a child, uh, Rebecca. You're so childish. Uh, but it's okay. God knows that. He knows you're a child. So he's going to talk to you uh, in the way an adult talks to a child. Mm -hmm. So that way he can draw you into a closer relationship with him. He talks to you in a way you can understand. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay. So when he's speaking to the psalmist, when he's speaking to the author of uh, the Gospel of John, when he's speaking to uh, the author of, of Jude and, and Peter the Apostle, when he's talking, you know, um, in all these, in Paul, in Ephesians 1, where Paul describes God as literally existing before the universe, plotting to, you know, figure out how to take over the world when he creates the universe. Those people were just childish. They just couldn't understand what God was really like. What we mm -hmm. really needed were a bunch of adults to come along, like a St. Augustine, you know, or Anselm, to come along and tell us the way the world, like, you know, what really is going on with God. Uh, those people were adults. They were adult enough for, to understand what it means to, for God to be timeless. But the Apostle Paul was not adult enough to really understand what God's like. Uh, that's, that ends up being like what you really have to say. And that's, that's, a, that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, mm -hmm. Especially if I look at the, the majority view throughout church history has been that God is timeless. And so I'm like, there seem like there are more than enough adults around to understand the deep truths about God that God did not actually need to describe himself as temporal because if, mm -hmm. if all these people could understand it then what, what was the justification for doing that so yeah so I, I think it's i think it causes a really i think it pushes people to make very bizarre claims that i don't think they really want to make i don't think anybody no one wants they everybody wants to say this childish kind of claim but nobody really wants to follow through and go oh, okay so you're an adult but the apostle paul's a child is mm -hmm. that what you want to say no one wants to say that part like they, they get embarrassed when they say that okay now um, you said that the words in Greek and Hebrew are all, are all temporal. Mm -hmm. Now, when we translate it into English, like let's say in the Gospel of John, we say eternal life. Now, do you? How do you understand like our translation into English? Do you think we have? Is that also a temporal way of expressing, or is that like expressing something that is not in the Greek? I, I mean, everlasting, I think would be a good way to, to translate it. God, But is you know, that still a temporal term to you? Oh, yeah. Because lasting, okay. lasting, you last for a while. Uh, well, if what if you're everlasting, well, you're going to last for forever. So 
Yeah. Okay. So it's um, still yeah. like a temporal expression. Mm -hmm. Even yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just, I think what's happened is we are often because of the history of Christian thought uh, and the history of Western thought as a whole is very mm -hmm. much been inclined to, to go towards timelessness mm -hmm. um, that we, when we see the words eternal, we immediately want to go, okay, let's make that a timeless where you don't have to. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's usually how this goes. Um, let me give you an example of actually how this strong tendency uh, and where you get a clash with the Bible. So the strong tendency to want to describe God and ultimate reality in terms of timelessness. You see this in Plato, um, uh, wanting to say like the ultimate reality is timeless. And there's this well-established way of talking about that, of saying that uh, to talk about a timeless present, to say the way mm -hmm. things you, know, you can say, talk about the timeless is or the timeless now. Mm -hmm. When you look at the book of Revelation, the author of Revelation intentionally describes God as the one who was, is, and is to come. Mm -hmm. Repeats that phrase multiple times throughout. Uh, and it's a well-established at that point in the Greco-Roman world to talk about God as is, not was, mm -hmm. not not to come. Mm -hmm. Because is, we all know that God's timeless, come on. But the author of Revelation is like, mm, the one who was, is, and is to come. And you're like, mm -hmm. this is a God with a history, and this is a God with a future. And this is a God who's here right now. That seems mm -hmm. to be what the author of Revelation wants to hammer over and over again. And that was not a popular formula at that point in history. And it doesn't become a popular formula in Christian thought for quite a while after uh, Revelation was written. Um, so it's, it's it seems like it's just really kind of in your face. Like, I know what you want to say about God, but I'm, I'm making something, a very different kind of claim because this is a God with a history. There's a God with us right now. Uh, so it's it's seems like it's kind of in your face. Like, yeah, I'm rejecting this kind of idea of God. I've got a different view of God here. Cool. Um, I, I want to save most of the questions to the end, guys, but I did want to put this one up because I think mm -hmm. it is good for right now. I think this is it. Does Ryan hold to William Lane Craig's view where God is timeless sans creation, but temporal from creation onward? No. Um, so here's why. Um, I, I've had some discussion with Craig about this. I've got an episode on my podcast too, where I interview Craig about this. So Craig wants to affirm this idea that time is a relationship between events. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that is, uh, you've got some problems there and I can explain those in a second. Um, but here's the bigger problem that most people have with Craig's view. It's not necessarily an incoherence. It's more of just this, we're scratching our heads saying, we don't know what you're talking about. So the claim is that God is timeless without the universe. That's what the Psalms means, but he's temporal with the universe. And so Craig, cannot say that God is timeless before the universe, because then that would be a before and after relation. That's a temporal mm -hmm. relation. So that's incoherent. And Craig knows that. And so he's like, I won't say that. So I'm going to say timeless without the universe and temporal with mm. the universe. And what most of us who do a lot of stuff on philosophy of time and philosophy of religion, when we come to that, we go, what exactly is the relationship between God's timeless phase and God's temporal phase? Because it can't be a before and after. It can't be mm -hmm. simultaneous because those are all temporal relations. And Craig says, well, maybe it's like a logical priority. I'd be like, well, logical priority doesn't work either because logical priority are when two states of affairs are compatible. So like, um, like, a, like, a, like an argument, um, like a valid argument. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. Those are mm -hmm. all, there's, you can talk about logical priority, but those are all mm -hmm. like compatible together. Existing without a universe and existing with a universe, those are mutually inconsistent states of affairs. So you can't, so mere logical priority doesn't capture that. So that can't be what's going on. Well, then I don't know what's going on. I don't know how to describe the relationship. I don't know what other things you could say to describe the relationship between the two. So on my view, I want to say God's temporal through and through. Mm -hmm. Full stop. He was temporal before, he was temporal after. There you go. No, no weird head scratching to try to figure out what I'm saying. Now, is there a lot of backlash against this idea of God being temporal? Yes. So the prisoner time objection you mentioned earlier, that's a big one. Uh, so I wrote a whole paper on that just to go, give me a real version of the argument because every version I find looks like it's kind of silly. Um, so, hmm. uh, and then now that I've got this crazy view where God is time, then you can't even talk about God being a prisoner of time because you'd be like, God's a prisoner of his own essence. He's a prisoner of his love. He's a prisoner of his power. And you're like, that sounds stupid on its face. So where's the objection? Mm. Um, the other kind of objections are if God's temporal and he couldn't know the future. And I'm like, you can be a Calvinist, be a Molinist, 
Or you could say God's got like much more predictive power than Google. Um, if you're an open theist, what's the big deal? What's the problem? Okay. Well, I mean, this is, uh, what, what do you think has driven, um, you know, like the majority view for so long of God being timeless, you know, even though there's like all these problems with it, what has like caused people to adhere to that view? Do you think? There are some different philosophical assumptions that are very, very popular throughout Western history. They're not pop as popular today, but they've been, they played a major role in, in, in the history of Western thought. Uh, so I identify two in my book. One's called the Platonic Assumption. So let's just talk about that one. This is the easiest mm -hmm. one to understand. Uh, so the claim is all change is for the better or worse. There are no value neutral changes. So if God's not doing anything and then he does something, well, there's a change. Well, then he's going to be getting better. Well, hang on. God's perfect. He can't get better. Mm. That doesn't make any sense. Like, well, was God getting worse? Well, no, he's perfect. You can't get worse. If you're perfect, you can't get worse. You weren't that great if you could get worse. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, so then he can't change uh, because all changes for the better or worse. If he's really perfect, he can't change. Well, if you're changeless, well, then you're going to exist without succession. Well, if you could exist without succession, well, that's timeless being. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. Like you're done. Like, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, I, I think it's intuitive. I think it has a good, like an intuitive pull. Um, and then, and then you see this argument pop up over and over again in all the major and minor thinkers throughout, uh, Western, uh, history. And what's your response to that? How is God not improving, um, yeah. in this temporal view? So I want to just go, okay, so let's look at this claim that all changes for the better or worse. Uh, all you need to do to show that's false is just give one example where there's a change that is not for the better or worse. And I'm like, well, that's super easy. Uh, let me give you a really, really boring story. Imagine that God creates a universe where there are just two electrons. That's it. Just two electrons mm -hmm. like swarming and like just spinning around in the void. Uh, at one moment, the electrons, uh, one's to the left of the, of the other one, the other one's to the right of the other one. At the next moment, they switch places. They have changed their location. Are things better? It's just electrons spinning in the void. What's better? Mm -hmm. Is it worse? What's worse? Like, it's just electrons spinning in the void. This is the most boring change you could possibly think of. What on earth could you mean by better or worse? Well, there is no better or worse. This is a value neutral change. Well, then it's false that all change is for the better or worse. So that first premise in the argument, okay. that, that assumption is just gone. Um, so that's, that's one way to try to attack the argument. That's the way that I, I develop in the in the forthcoming book. Um, and then I've got this um, this little popular level essay that I wrote that's on my website called "Can God Change?" And I talk about this uh, in that in that um, little essay. Okay, can you talk a little bit more about that? Because you gave one example, but mm -hmm. I mean, are it seems like there would be examples of God improving or something like that as a temporal being. Do you, would you, do you, would you like deny that also? Yeah. So I think the okay. way to think about it is, so you're, we're think, talking about a being that's got, um, that, that's the greatest possible being. So it's got mm -hmm. all these perfections. So it's got the cognitive perfection of having like maximal knowledge or the ability to know all things. And it's got maximal power. It's got mm -hmm. perfect rationality, perfect moral goodness. And like, well, what kind of, what would that, what would it look like for that being to perform its freedom, its free actions? Mm -hmm. Because to go from not acting to acting, which is to exercise power and to freely exercise your power, that involves a change. So it seems like it would be an imperfection if God cannot change because then God couldn't freely perform an action. So it seems like the very idea of having all power and having perfect freedom just entails that God's going to be one way and then another way. So it seems like it just, you have to have change in order to actually be perfect in power and perfect in freedom. And then perfect in knowledge. Well, wouldn't it be really weird if God's knowledge never changed? So God's like, I know that I exist without a universe and I know that I've not decided to create anything at all. And then he creates a universe and he still says, I know that I exist all alone and I've not decided to do anything at all. You're like, well, you don't, mm -hmm. that's stupid. No, like if you're perfect in knowledge, your knowledge should track the way the world is. And if performing an action like creating a universe and existing with the universe, if your knowledge doesn't change, that's imperfect. Seems like perfect knowledge would require that your knowledge always tracks the way the world is. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So it demands that your knowledge change. Uh, it would be an imperfection if God did not change. So I don't see is God getting better because he knows a few more things. Um, I just see it as it's just it, him changing is just an entailment from having these certain kinds of perfections and the exercise of those perfections. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was the other resistance? You said there were a couple of things that made people resist the idea of God mm -hmm. being temporal. Yeah. So here's another big one. Um, other than just say like, Oh God, God would change. And so that'd be really bad. Um, I'm trying to think of another really good one. That's easy to explain because that's usually the biggest one. Um, okay. Here's another one. A lot of people assume that time is a created thing. Uh, so like even William Lane Craig, who wants to say God's temporal because mm -hmm. God's timeless without the universe and then temporal with the universe. Well, there's a sense in which God creates time with the universe on that view. Uh, and if you, and so some people will go, oh, so time's this created thing. Time's a creature. Well, if God's temporal, well, then God's a creature. Mm, mm -hmm. You made God a creature. That's not, that's not, that's not good. He's supposed to be the creator, not the creature. So that's, that's mm -hmm. another kind of objection you'll, you'll see a lot. Okay. And what's your response to that? So if I say that, uh, time is God itself, um, well then it's just, it's just false that time's a, cr a created thing. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's a, it's just, it just, yeah, just, it just removes uh, the, the objection entirely. Um, but if time is just a relationship between uh, events or just exist, if and only if change exists, like it does on Craig's view or St. Augustine's view, a lot of these people who want to affirm this view, it doesn't really make sense to me to say like, sure, like time's created in the sense of like, it didn't always exist, but it doesn't make something a creature just because it's temporal because temporal is just doing one thing and then another. Mm -hmm. Um, so God's a necessarily existent being. He wasn't doing anything. And then he decides to do some stuff. Well, that doesn't make him a creature. Like that, that just, it's just, it, that just doesn't make any sense. Um, and also it's perfectly fine for God to take on created categories if you believe in the incarnation because God became mm -hmm. human. Uh, so is it really going to be that big of a problem for Christians if they want to say God took on a few uh, creaturely properties every now and then? Because if it is, then you can't have an incarnation. So who cares, uh, is, is, I guess is kind of, kind of my response to, to that. Okay. Well, let's talk about this idea. Okay. I, did I, am I expressing this the way that you did? God is time or mm -hmm. time. Okay. Yeah. It, that just sounds really, really weird. It is. So, it sounds really weird. <laughs> so can you make that not sound weird? Like uh, explain to yeah. me where, where <laughs> Where, why are you embracing this idea? Why is this, why does this work? Um, so Isaac Newton at some point had a mental breakdown um, mm -hmm. after he developed his, his physics and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he became, I think he became like the treasurer for the Bank of England. And he th found mm -hmm. that was easier uh, and less stressful than doing. Um, so it might be the case that I'm in the midst of a mental breakdown uh, because I'm embracing okay. these kind of views that Isaac Newton did. Mm -hmm. And then maybe I'll become like the treasurer of the Bank of England and it'll be less stressful. I'm terrible at math, so that's unlikely. Uh, um, but anyway, so okay, so here's so here's the idea. So let me, I'll say again what time is on this view, uh, and then mm -hmm. I'll explain how God satisfies all these roles. So this is what's called the absolute theory of time, and so the idea is there's a distinction between time itself and moments of time. So a moment of time is the way things are, but could be subsequently otherwise. Mm -hmm. Time itself is the thing that makes change possible. Just makes change possible. Mm -hmm. How is there change possible in the world? Time. That's what time does. Uh, time is also the source of moments. So this is the thing that like makes moments come into existence. Mm -hmm. And then it's the thing that orders a series of moments into some sort of like coherent timeline. Those are like three of the big roles that time plays. I want to go, okay, cool. What does it mean for God to be time? Well, it means for God to play those, th those three roles. God's the thing that makes change possible. Why? Because the kind of nature that he has. He's a being that has power and freedom. And that entails the ability to bring about changes uh, and be able to create things that also can change. So God's nature itself is the thing that makes change possible. God's the source of moments because God existing by himself, that's the way things are. And they could be subsequently otherwise because God's a being, again, with freedom and power. And that entails the ability to make things be different at the next moment. If God exercises his power, 
he brings about another moment. And if he exercises power again and again, he brings about another moment. Whether you're a Calvinist, a Molinist, or an open theist, you're going to say God's got a plan for how he wants a particular series of moments to come about. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to say, okay, well, then that's what it means to organize a series of moments into a coherent timeline. So God's the thing that makes change possible. He's the source of the moments. And he's the thing that orders the series of moments into a coherent timeline. God plays all three roles of time. So God is mm -hmm. to be identified with time. That's that's the idea. I don't know if that makes it sound less crazy, but I mean, it's still it's still a pretty difficult concept. I'll have to think about that. It took me to give to help you understand. Like, it took me years. I had uh, someone in 2011 tell me, like, "Oh, you should just yeah. say that. You should say God's time." And I'm like, "That's nuts." And then um, in 2017, I was getting ready to go to Slovakia. Uh, it was uh -huh. 2008, 2018. I was getting ready to go to Slovakia to present uh, a paper where I was going to actually argue this for the first time. And I'm like, this is crazy. All these people are going to think I'm nuts. And, you know, and then, um, and there was these uh, uh, logicians from Russia in the room and they were like, you're saying these things, that's kind of crazy. And I was like, what if I just say God's time? Would that make it less crazy? And they're like, it's weird, but yeah, it gets, it gets rid of all the problems. I'm like, okay, okay. So some people who know logic really well don't think it's too nuts. Maybe it's okay to say <laughs> Now, what you're, when you wrote The End of the Timeless God, was this your view of time? No, no. I didn't know what time okay. was. I had no idea. Okay. So you uh, just kind of yeah. left it open or how did you mm -hmm. how did you address that in the book? Well, okay. So I do talk about this absolute versus um, relational theory of time in there, mm -hmm. which is more than what most people do. So what most people do when they talk about God and time is they start with this quote from St. Augustine where they say, where Augustine says, I know what time is unless you ask me. As soon as you ask me, I don't know. And then they just move on from there. And that is what almost everyone does. And so I refused mm. to do that in the first book. What I did instead was I, I quoted um, uh, this guy named Pierre Gassendi from the Scientific Revolution who says the exact same thing. Um, so I just so was like, so it's like I'm being novel. I'm being different and cutting edge by just quoting somebody else saying the exact same thing. So that, but that still annoyed me though, because I was like, I don't know what time is. And I, I'm getting really annoyed about trying to have these conversations and not knowing what time is. And so that's been the big uh, emphasis for this current book that I'm writing on is going, we can't do that anymore. We can't keep playing this cheeky uh, Augustine story where we're like, oh, don't know what it is, but I'm going to keep pretending like I can talk about it meaningfully. I'm like, no, you can't. You cannot do that. We have to talk about what time is. Otherwise, you can talk about God's relationship to this thing that we don't know. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a really exciting book. God's relationship to something or other great YouTube title for the video, you know, like, no, we got to talk about what time is. What it, do, you said you're almost finished with the book. Do you have a title and can you tell us a little bit more about it? Mm -hmm. So it's, so the working title at the moment is from divine time maker to divine watchmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea is to look at this view where people say God creates time. Uh, so he's mm -hmm. a time maker. And then this other view where it's, you know, God is time itself. Um, but when God creates a universe, he creates uniform laws of nature by which you could develop a clock. So God's a watchmaker because mm -hmm. he's not creating time. Instead, he's creating like a watch. Mm. Uh, and so then trying to track down uh, the history of these different views. So this crazy view that God is time, I'm like, okay. I was able to trace down a bunch of different people in the uh, scientific revolution and even prior to that who affirmed this view. And then a bunch of modern people, like some people alive today or who died like not all that long ago, who seem like they kind of hold this view. So it's not at, so I'm like, I'm not the only one who's nuts. Um, and then tracing it down throughout the Hindu tradition as well and going, actually, there's a lot of people in the Hindu tradition uh, who have affirmed this. And it seems like it's in some of the sacred texts. And so it's like, okay. And then trying to identify all the possible problems you could have with any of these views uh, and just trying to see how you know, how you develop the arguments and see how people can deal with them. One of, we're going to get a whole chapter on just looking at here's Calvinism, here's Molinism, here's open theism. Mm. Uh, so I got some stuff like that there too. Hmm. Awesome. Um, I want to put this question up here for you um, from Sentinel, Rob at Sentinel Apologetics. I've had some ex-Christians argue to me that their reasons for leaving the faith involves their red pilling moment of learning process philosophy. Thoughts? I think if um, if I thought my only options were process philosophy, uh, yeah, I, I would probably I'd probably leave too. Um, so there's it's okay. I try to. What is process philosophy? Yeah. I don't know that. What it's this um, it's this movement that started in the early 1900s with uh, this guy named Alfred North Whitehead, mm -hmm. uh, and then 
Um, there's another guy named Charles Hartshorn who came along a bit later, developed it further, and it became this whole like a theological movement as well. So it was not a, so Whitehead was not like adhering to any particular kind of religion, but he still wanted to believe that there was a God. And so he's trying to develop a new philosophical system entirely. So the idea is you reject categories like substances, like things. And so you're like, there are no things. There's just processes or events. And it sounds like you're doing like beatnik poetry at that point. And I don't know how you're not doing beatnik poetry at that point, because I just think this sounds really crazy. Um, so uh, Whitehead originally presented some of these ideas, um, what's called the Gifford Lectures. It's this series of lectures in Scotland. And so he presented them in the, it was at Edinburgh. And most of the people in the room apparently didn't understand what he was saying uh, because they're like, there's no things. There's just events and mm -hmm. experiences and happenings. And that just sounds nuts. Um, there's this other uh, Scottish philosopher that I like to quote in light of this who says, okay, so there's a guy named Thomas Reed. And so Thomas Reed says, okay, um, there's a thing called common sense. Now, if you want to tell me that there could be thoughts and experiences without things that have thoughts and have experiences, there's just these thoughts just floating around. If that's not, if that's common sense, then I should like to know what nonsense is. And I just think that's right. Like, I just like when they start telling me like, yeah, there's just experiences at the rock bottom of reality. And I'm like, but what's having the experiences? There's like, no, there's no, there's no things. And I'm like, Okay. And you tell me you're giving me a common sense story of the world. They're like, yes, 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 we swear. Because that's a big part of process philosophy is we've got hardcore common sense notions. And I'm like, cool. Let me give one further objection to it. Um, so they'll tell me events are fundamental to reality. And I'm like, cool. Okay. Tell me what an event is. Uh, well, an event on most accounts, including uh, Whitehead's account, is that uh, an event is a substance having a property at a time. And you're like, cool. You told me there are no substances. And an event is a substance having a property at a time, but there are no substances. Well, then what? The, I, like, I'm sorry, I don't know what an event is anymore now. So, but these are the fundamental things of reality. That's weird. That doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, I just want to, I just think it's not common sense. I think it's weird. Okay. Um, and if anybody else has questions for Dr. Mullins, now is a good time to put them in. Um, this is from the biblical truth. Uh, our God is in heaven. He does whatsoever he pleases. Is the heaven spoken of in this verse located in time somewhere temporally? Mm -hmm. uh, you would just say now. Exist now. Mm -hmm. uh, so does God exist now? Yeah. And what's he doing? He's doing whatever he pleases. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's that temple. Yeah. So, um, Let's see if there's anybody. Okay. I, I don't see any other questions coming in right now, but there were some earlier, but it would take me too long to scroll. Okay. So you guys are going to have to rewrite them if you want me to ask. Um, I guess um, my remaining thing is kind of just tr trying to understand um, what it means that if I understand God as temporal. And so I'm understanding that Okay, he is he is going along in time just as I am and mm -hmm. just as everyone else in the world is God is existing within time. Um I guess are there any remaining reasons that I I would have a like that this could cause a theological problem? Like it, you know, is there something fundamental about Christianity that just makes this wrong? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. I, I've heard you express reasons why, hey, the timeless view is actually, you know, precludes Christianity. Christianity does not work with the timeless view. But somehow all these people, Christians throughout history, held this timeless view. Um, you know, even you know, as someone who embraces open theism, I'm still having this hard time, like, letting go of this idea of, yeah. you know, the timeless God. So... I mean, is there any reason, is there anything heretical about this view? Um, possibly. Uh, so it depends if you want to affirm the Fifth Ecumenical Council. And most 
professional theologians don't even know the content of that council. So if you don't know the content of that council, you're in very, very good company because most people have never even heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a council that happened at uh, Constantinople. It's called Constantinople III. And it was in 551, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Um, when they are talking about uh, the relationship between God the Father and God the Son, they describe it as uh, a chronos, a temporal, timeless. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's the idea. So there's this doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son. It has no biblical basis, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it's in the creeds. Um, so the claim is that the Father timelessly causes the Son to timelessly exist. That's that's the statement in the creeds. Okay. Uh, again, there's no biblical basis for this, but um, but if you affirm that, then you going to be like, well, hang on, can I really say God's temporal? Um, because it says timeless right there in the creed. And you'd be like, well, mm -hmm. here's some here's some options for you. One, you could go, eh, I'm vaguely Protestant. I don't really care about any councils after a Chalcedon. Uh, does anyone even know what those other councils are? And mm -hmm. again, the average Christian theologian that I talk to, they can't name most of the councils. So you're in really mm -hmm. good company. We're all heretics okay. together. We're all a bunch of ignorant people together. It's fun. It's fine. It's good. Um, here's, a, so here's another option though, if you don't like that one, uh, you could go, I can't affirm the letter of the creed, but I can affirm the spirit of the creed mm -hmm. because I don't think that God timelessly causes God, the father timelessly causes the son to timelessly exist. Uh, instead I can say the, the father eternally or everlastingly causes the son to everlastingly exist. You could say that. And so William mm -hmm. Hasker, who's an open theist. And he wants to affirm the eternal generation of the sun because I've had a debate with him on this in, a, in, the, in, the, in some journals. Uh, and he goes, yeah, that's what he wants to say. I think that view entails a heresy. I think just the idea of the father causing the son to exist right. full stop entails a heresy. Okay. Um, so I'm just like, well, if I want to affirm the letter of the creed, then I'm going to affirm the, the view that was also condemned as a heresy in the creed. That's not good. Um, so maybe I'll just really dig down on me being vaguely Protestant and going, creeds are not infallible. So who cares? Um, but not mm -hmm. everyone likes that. Not everyone likes that. So yeah. So you got some options. One is which is just to just claim ignorance like most Christians do and just okay. like, oh, where does it say that? Um, and Or you could be like, oh crap, Ryan told me where it says that. So now I can't claim ignorance anymore. So I'll pull this William Hasker card. Um, or you could just go vaguely Protestant. Who cares? Uh, like, right. Yeah. Okay. There's, pro there's probably some other options too, but yeah, those are, those are some. Cool. Well, this has been such an amazing discussion. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Do you have any final things that I didn't get to that like you really feel like are important points um, with understanding the temporality of God? I guess here's okay. I guess just mm -hmm. to kind of sum up because we hit a lot of the major points. We didn't get into mm -hmm. all of them in detail, but you know, mm -hmm. this is a YouTube video. You can't do everything in super long detail. Re it really comes down to this. If you're saying God's temporal, you're saying God does one thing and then another. That's it. Mm -hmm. God was like, I wasn't always creating a universe, then I created one. I wasn't always in a mm -hmm. covenantal relationship with Moses because Moses didn't always exist. And then at some point, right. Moses came into existence. So I was like, hey, Moses, come over here. Um, I'm doing some stuff in this bush right now. I want to I I I help uh, free you guys out of captivity. He's just doing one thing after another. Mm -hmm. that, when you put it that, like that, which is just a literal description of temporality, it doesn't sound that crazy. It just sounds like... Right oh, well, that's just just called reading the Bible. Um, so like, what's the big deal? I think a lot of the other problems that people typically point out are people bringing their own assumptions about the nature of time and their own assumptions about timelessness uh, on like into, onto the table and going like, there's all these other problems. I think when you sort them out, you go, those really have, they're really not that big of a deal. Because at the end of the day, it just is go, it's just me saying, God does one thing and then another. And that and doesn't sound which that controversial. Is very, very biblical, right? I mean, we yeah. see this is how God interacts with humanity. So really yeah. not a big deal. But I guess at the end of the day, we can say this, Rebecca, you mm -hmm. and I, we're just creating God in our own image uh, and we're just worshiping an idol. So, you know, that's that's the big problem with our with our view of <laughs> saying God's temporal. Okay, so um, Rob says, how does this affect the fact that we are in a finite universe of 13.8 billion years and the possibility of God's temporal engagement with his divine counsel. Mm, okay. So um, if you want to take this idea of a divine counsel, like literally, like there is really 
some cohort of some kind of divine beings that God's like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we should create a universe. Wouldn't that be really cool? You would just say all that's taking place before uh, God creates the universe. Um, and then, yeah, the universe being 13 and a half billion years old, give or take a billion, it wouldn't affect anything because you're just saying God made a bunch of plans before he created the universe. Mm. Ephesians 1 makes that very clear. That's what Apostle, the, no, Paul says, that before God oh. creates, he's plotting things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, would, it shouldn't change anything. Um, Patrick Barnes asks, seeing Dr. Mullen's site with links to his papers, is there any way to tell which ones are accessible and valuable to the layman and which ones are more for other scholars? Mm -hmm. uh, so on my website, I do have a section of popular papers, but most of those aren't on time. Most of those are on um, some other issues. And then somehow I was able to do a popular one on divine simplicity, which is even more technical and weird um, than the timelessness stuff. Uh, I would, I guess I would suggest, um, there's this one paper called the prisoner of time objection. I think that one's a bit easier to get into, uh, then if you're feeling a little bit more, um, advanced, then tr check out maybe the one called the divine time maker. Um, so I try to make everything as accessible as possible, but yeah, all the, all the papers on my website are, are freely available. They're not behind a paywall or anything like that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, whoops, this is what I wanted to put up. Yeah. Zing asked, I joined midstream. What exactly is Dr. Mullen's point? So I'll kind of sum it up as a, a closing thing and kind of advertise your book again. Um, Dr. Mullins is promoting the idea that we need to get rid of the, the atemporality, the idea that God is atemporal or timeless, that that is a big mess for Christianity. It doesn't work. And it's like philosophically incoherent and that God is temporal and we need to embrace that view. He wrote a book called the end of the timeless God, or did I say that correctly? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. The end of the timeless God. He's working on a second book on the topic of God and time. And he has lots of uh, papers on his website. And I really hope that we can have a, another talk about some of the other issues. I'd love to do one on the incarnation and the Trinity and the different topics that you've tackled uh, in, relating to theology. And so um, thank you so much for your work and do check out Dr. Mullen's podcast, The Reluctant Theologian. The link is in the description. His website is also there. So, um, and I just want to thank you for your work, Dr. Mullins. It just blesses me so much that you are worshiping God with all your mind in this way and working out these issues. And so thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so, so much for saying that. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.